A very, very good morning to you. Welcome to our service this morning. Good morning. Thank you, June. Thank you. You will have noticed from our pew sheet that today, Sunday, is um, described as our stewardship Sunday. And every year we set aside a Sunday to think about our finances, our, our giving to the church. And today is that Sunday. So welcome especially to this uh, time when we're going to be thinking about our giving and stewardship. Without your generosity, our ministry and our presence here in this community would not be possible. And so it's good, it really is good and healthy to reflect on uh, our financial situation and on, on, and on our own giving and stewardship. Julian will be presenting some figures uh, shortly. That's why we have the screen up uh, this morning and um, so that's going to come later. But first, let's be reminded in our opening hymn that the tribute that we first bring to God is not our gold and silver, it is our worship and our praise. To his feet thy tribute bring, praise my soul, the King of heaven. The Lord be with you. And also you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please like to sit or kneel as we come to a time of confession? Let's bring before God just in the silence those things we especially need to know, those areas of our life where we especially need to know his forgiveness and his mercy. Lord God, we come before you 
with penitent hearts and with faith, seeking your forgiveness and your mercy through Jesus, our Saviour. We confess our sins by saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's work with, with joy and giving and generosity in our hearts. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end, for he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Julian so that we can just be presented with a picture of where we are financially as a church and uh, after that we'll uh, see where we go. Hoping the technology will work this morning so please bear with me if it doesn't. Um, but um, as Robert has said um, I'm just going to rightly as um, your treasurer um, give you a picture of how this church stands financially and a few other statistics this morning it will be fairly brief um, and it's not meant to replace the sermon which is coming later um, so um, those are the areas that i'm going to just touch on this morning um, just so that you have a better understanding of our finances in this church the finances of the benefice, including Howe and Framingham Earl, um, and also um, a little bit of a picture about the diocese finances as well, um, which have come into a, a good bit more focus as a result of um, the pandemic, um, because there's been a big um, hit to income overall for churches, um, not just in Norfolk, but across the country. Um, and so, um, just a quick summary of where we were um, last year um, through a year of um, pandemic and what happens with our income. I'm sorry this is not very beautiful and you, hopefully you, you can see some of these numbers. But essentially um, what this says in terms of our income is that um, our giving makes up about three quarters of our total income generally year to year. Um, and what happened um, between 2019 and 2020 was that our income went down by about 10%. A lot of the impact of that um, was felt um, with our contact magazine because we weren't able to publish it all year. Um, but our giving went down a little bit as well um, because we didn't have so many services. Um, compared to 2019, um, we had some big expenditure in 2019, so we redid the church path all the way around um, the, the church, and that's the main reason for that deficit in 2019. Um, other than that, in both years, we effectively um, uh, had um, not much of a surplus or deficit um, overall. Um, we matched our income and expenditure with the exception of the, ch the church path, which was funded um, a little bit from previous year's legacy income. 
And you'll see there as well that our reserves at the end of 2020 were about 24,000. Some of those are earmarked reserves, they're legacy funds and other things um, for things like the printer for um, contact um, that we keep to one side. Um, in terms of our expenses, um, between two-thirds and three-quarters of our expenses um, goes on our parish share to the diocese. Um, that's, uh, and that's been a pretty um, standard picture for the last few years, and it's not untypical of um, most parishes as well. Um, the, the rest of the expenditure is largely around keeping this building going and also um, supporting the youth project. So what happens this year, I think this is the, the sort of picture that we're getting this year. So our income, um, by the way, I forgot to say at the beginning, all of these numbers are in thousands of pounds. Um, it's, not, um, it's not that we don't count the pennies, we do, every one. Um, but in terms of actually just presenting a picture, um, it, it's uh, easier to actually see those numbers. And this year, um, we're probably going to have a deficit of about £5,000. And the reason for that is um, that we um, have got enough reserves to make um, an additional parish share um, uh, payment this year, which I think will be about £5,000. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit more ab about that uh, when I come to um, the uh, diocese position. Um, and you can see the picture this year is not dissimilar to uh, last year as well. In terms of our expenses, our expenses have been um, pretty similar this year as well. Um, we haven't had any big um, maintenance spend on the building um, or the, the fabric or, the, or um, around um, the church premises this year as we have done in previous years. So what are we paying um, the diocese next year? And this is sort of not untypical, actually, of what we've paid in the last um, two or three years. They're asking um, for us as a benefice to pay about 52,000, um, which is pretty much what they have done for the last three years. Um, the other churches in the benefice will probably contribute about um, 10 to 12,000 of that, we hope which leaves us to do the balance, which is about 40,000, um, which is what we aimed to um, pay them last year, in fact. What we can afford on an ongoing basis is a roughly the level of our regular giving, which is about 32,000. So we are able to afford um, about 80% of generally what they ask us for. And that's so for the other ch um, churches in the benefice, it's also, um, uh, interestingly, not untypical of churches in Norfolk. What we should pay the diocese is actually a little bit more. Um, and uh, the, the, the diocese um, don't let us off, but they actually realise that we're not going to pay the full amount, but they set us a challenging target. But what we should pay them as a benefit is 66,000. That's... Um, um, to cover um, not just the costs of a full-time minister, um, but also diocese um, mission costs and training costs as well. Um, and our share of that 66,000 is probably about 54,000. So we pay, we pay about 60% of what we should pay the diocese. Um, the diocese statistics, so this is quite interesting. So I'm comparing All Saints with the diocese overall for, for the whole of Norfolk. And um, what they asked for um, uh, last year was nearly eight million pounds. Um, they actually got just over six million. Um, and so they got about 77% of what they asked for and we gave them 80% of what we were asked for. So we were pretty much the same. Um, and um, the impact of the pandemic on um, diocese, diocese income was about a million pounds last year. So it was fairly chunky. Um, and in terms of the impact of the, the um, pandemic, Norwich Diocese was the sixth worst diocese in the country, I think. 
So, some diocese information, because all of this is, and I, I didn't know all of this until I looked it up actually yesterday. They do pay our rector, so that's rather important. Um, uh, but they don't pay the bishop. That's quite interesting, isn't it? The church commissioners pay, pay him. Um, they don't get any income from the uh, close in Norwich, just in case you wondered. Um, the Dean of Norwich and the cathedral get that, and given the, the uh, um, costs of um, keeping the cathedral in one piece, um, that's probably appropriate. They have made really significant redundancies um, and savings over the course of the last year, so people have actually gone um, as a result. They're mainly um, not parish ministry people, they are people um, who were involved in ministry in different places, um, including a church army post, but there's a number of other posts that have gone as well. And diocese income generally has remained fairly flat for the last decade, despite a lot of sacrificial giving. And that reflects the fact that we're um, an elderly um, uh, uh, um, community in Norfolk, um, and all of us are getting older. Some of us are um, not remaining with us. And so um, there are fewer of us to actually keep um, the churches running. So what can we do? Because this is not all about money, and a Stewardship Sunday should be about reviewing all of our giving, not just money, our giving of time as well. Pray about the overall situation. Pray for the bishop and other people um, in the diocese who have to make difficult decisions about finances, um, and um, ask God to help them in that, that really difficult situation. It's not easy keeping going an organization that is facing deficits. Do pray about your own giving, both money and time, and other things as well. Um, and it's not just about your giving to the church. A lot of people give, I know, to other charities um, and, uh, um, and, and work that is very appropriate and, and um, uh, um, things that we should be supporting. Pray about that too. The biblical measure is a tithe of our income, um, and people interpret that in different ways, um, but um, God is looking for us to be um, a people of generosity. Pray for more people to follow Jesus. We should be doing that anyway, um, and money is not about that, but um, um, uh, it will help the money situation if there are more people following Jesus and more people in our churches. Um, and maybe that's um, the, one of the most important messages out of this morning. Practically, um, gift aid and regular giving is a big help to the church. Gift aid, um, if you pay tax, um, will increase um, your giving by about 25%. And a lot of you already do that and commit to regular payments. Um, and that's really helpful, um, either through the envelope scheme or through bank, um, uh, bank credits. And those of you who are doing that, I'm giving out appropriate thank you letters this morning to say a big thank you, especially to you, but a thank you to all, all of you who actually give on a less regular basis as well, because it all ha ha helps the overall situation. Do talk about money. Um, and, you know, it, it's, money is a horrible to, taboo subject these days. Um, we talk about government finances, but um, we, d we find a real reluctance to talk about our own money. Um, it's interesting, I don't see that um, culture in the early church. If you look through the New Testament, um, particularly the epistles and the book of Acts, money did get talked about and there was um, acts of sacrificial giving that were talked about as well. Money should not be a taboo subject in, in the church of those who follow Jesus. Finally, a huge, huge thank you. If you want one little postscript um, that is a little bit closer to home, um, I'm going to actually be very open about something that is 
Graham and I have been doing over the last few months, which is trying to deal with um, Jenny Oates's estate. And uh, some of you will have um, seen that her house has been sold recently. Jenny didn't have any direct um, descendants. Um, she's given quite a bit of money to her three nieces who don't live locally to here. But she decided in her will to give most of what she had left to uh, a lot of different charities, including this church um, and including the other churches where she worship worshipped in her lifetime. And in her death, she's given over a quarter of a million pounds to those different charities, um, um, which is a wonderful sacrificial um, gift. Now, not all of us will be in a position to do that because some of us have descendants who we want to, uh, direct descendants who we want to um, provide for, and that's entirely appropriate. But that's an example close to home of somebody who gave her life to Jesus and reflected that in her giving, um, and an example to us. I want to thank you this morning for the giving that you are giving to the church, time, money, and gifts, and all of those things, um, and ask you to reflect on that today as well. Thank you. that presentation and for being so clear uh, about uh, about that whole area of, of, of stewardship and um, can I also add my own uh, personal gratitude and thanks to all of you who are supporting my ministry here it always humbles me to see that and to know that that's happening so a really really uh, big thank you uh, to you all Let's just, let's just pray, let's just bow our heads, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for, your, for the people that you call uh, to follow you. Thank you for that call you've put on, on our lives, Lord, this morning. And Lord, we thank you for our, for our ministries here in this church, where you've placed us, where we live. We thank you for our, our weekly services for Coffee Stop, for Contact Magazine, for Food Bank, for the youth work, for the school's work, for the baptisms, weddings and funerals, Lord, that witness to you and witness to your presence here in this place. Lord, thank you for the generosity and love that allows all these ministries to, to happen and Lord we pray that these ministries will not just continue but they would flourish and that new ministries new doors would also open up to us Lord please touch each and every life please touch each and every heart today so that we might follow you more dearly more closely and more nearly uh, day by day in Jesus wonderful name we pray Amen I'm 
The reading is taken from Daniel 7, starting at verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel is taken from John chapter 18. Glory to you, O Lord. Pilate then went back inside the palace 
summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, wow, a lot to take in this morning. Um, and I'm not going to be preaching about money this morning, um, although there is a link, um, but that isn't my primary aim. Um, but thank you. Yes, you'll see. I just thought I'd tell you at the outset, in case you were <laughs> wondering. Um, we're looking at those passages from Daniel. So um, let's pray. Father, we lift our eyes to you this morning. And we lift our eyes to your son, Jesus, who is placed above every dominion, every power, every authority. His name is higher. And we want to give you glory this morning. And we acknowledge your greatness we acknowledge your authority. We acknowledge your majesty. And we give you thanks for all that you have given to us. So we bless your name this morning. We ask that you would, um, yes, lift our eyes to you this morning as we look at your word. Give us clear sight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Daniel. I was going to say, Daniel's a bit of a funny old book. <laughs> so sorry. Um, Daniel's one of those books. The first six chapters are quite nice. Good little stories. Um, Daniel and the lion's den, the ones that, that, that's the part that perhaps if we went to Sunday school, we know those stories. Daniel's in the, Daniel in the lion's den, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego um, walking in the fire with a fourth person with them. Um, amazing and wonderful stories. And then you get to chapter seven and it all starts going a little bit more strange. And um, the second half of Daniel is very much a record of Daniel was a normal person in the sense that he was living at the time when Israel um, had been destroyed by Babylon pretty much and Babylon was an empire that was increasing and increasing in size as empires seem to like to do and um, at some point that came to Israel and it came to what was left of Israel actually, which was just Judah. So there's only a tiny bit left by that time anyway. And um, as Judah wouldn't do what they were told, as in pay lots of money, funnily enough, to, <laughs> to Babylon, Babylon came and flattened the place. And they did it twice. First time they came and they took all the important people, uh, anyone who might be a leader and they took them away into exile into Babylon. And then Israel, that little bit of Judah, still didn't do what it was told. And so Babylon got a bit more cross and came back and flattened the entire place. And their policy was 
pretty much to remove as many people as possible, stick them somewhere else so that they would be disorientated and then there would be no more trouble, if you like, from this quite small now principality. And Daniel we, was one of those people who was taken away in the first exodus. Um, and he was, uh, basically they took anybody, all the young men who might be leaders, all the people who they thought could be useful, if you like, and they transferred them to the Babylonian government and they were used in Babylon. And we know from the beginning of Daniel that he and his friends, um, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were used in that way. And. Um, Daniel, therefore, was, um, if you like, a civil servant um, for the Babylonian government, a foreign government, a government that did not worship his God. And um, he was, if you like, in captivity in that place. Um, and while he was there in this situation, which was a time of great despair for Israel at the time, because they never thought this could ever happen. And right up to the end, they were confident that even though the, the, the prophets had warned them and warned them and warned them and warned them for hundreds of years, they still would not believe that they were, they were in peril. Um, they'd sort of got themselves into a sort of a, quite an arrogant place. Um, Daniel was different and so were a few of the people who were taken out of Israel at that time. Um, there was a revival, if you like, in Israel just before the Exodus. There was a, the last king um, was one who led the people to really pursue and get their hearts right before God. And that king, um, he was the second to last, actually there was a few but I won't bore you with that but quite shortly before that time there was a king who really took God seriously and went after him with all of his heart and so Daniel would have been part of that generation who knew that and had the example of that king unfortunately that king got killed another one came in place and it all went wrong but basically <laughs> um, there was that little window where the people who were about to be taken away to somewhere far away actually had the opportunity to worship God and to know that real relationship with God and become men of God, if you like. So that what nobody know, knew at the time, because this is the thing with history, it's really easy when you look back to see, oh yeah, that caused that, and if that person had done that instead of that, then, then this would have been, and that, that pivotal moment changed history from that point and when we look back we can see it and we can start to as far as I can tell argue about what the interpretation is of everything but when you're in history when you're in the time you can't you don't have that perspective and for Daniel in that perspective we can look at it and say well we know what happens we know that it's going to be all right in the end but he didn't have that same perspective. He was in the middle of it. And in the middle of it, it felt like the world had come to the end. It felt like they had been completely abandoned. It felt like everything had gone back to the beginning. It felt like, well, what was all that about? And now I'm working for the king of Babylon. And in that place that felt like everything had been lost, if you like, Daniel was somebody who started to have some visions. And God showed him certain things about the future. And we tend to think of visions and prophecy about the future, but it's not so much about the future. It might involve that, but it's more about Daniel gets lifted up to a different perspective. We live life in amongst the history of the earth. This is our knowledge and understanding on a day-to-day -day basis. But God has a different perspective and a different view. And when, when um, we get to Daniel 7, it's like 
Daniel is shown what's going on on the earth from heaven's perspective, if you like. I think of it as it's a throne's eye view, if you can think of it. It's like if you were a bird and you, <laughs> you were flying over um, pouring land, your perspective and understanding of pouring land very different to when you're walking um, from the church to budgeons and back again. You see it in a completely different way. And this passage is about thrones. And when there are things about thrones, thrones are about authority. And what Daniel is being shown is something about authority on the earth. And we see, I'll have to read it, and if you are able to, because I know not everybody has a pictorial imagination, but if you do, I invite you to just close your eyes and imagine this like you're watching a movie, like you're Daniel. He says, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire, and a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. And um, that's what, if you like, Daniel saw. And when he saw this, it was immediately after something he'd been shown just before. And just before the throne appeared, and actually, it's quite interesting when you see this throne appeared because there's a few people in the Bible who get to see, if you like, the, the throne of God. And if you compare the things they see, there's some similarities and also some differences. So they're seeing, if you like, the same throne. Ezekiel saw the wheels within a wheel. Um, when you get to Revelation, um, you see the books being opened and the thrones being put in place and you see the thousands upon thousands waiting on the throne. Um, and this little passage is a little bit like the whole book of Revelation but in one chapter. It's like um, a preview or a a trailer for a movie, <laughs> if you like, you know, when you see all the, all the highlights. Um, Daniel is shown something of heaven's perspective on, on earthly authority. And what he's shown in brief, he doesn't understand it the first time, but he remembers to ask somebody, and then there's a chapter that says, this is what it means, which is good for us, because that means we've got some understanding. But what is shown is all sorts of horrible beasts appear and it's explained to Daniel, he sees four of them. And it's explained to Daniel that each one of those beasts represent an empire on the earth. Now Daniel is currently working within the Babylonian empire. From God's, when, when you're in an empire, those empires which go on for generations, sometimes hundreds of years. Roman Empire went on for hundreds of years. They seem like so solid, so fixed, like their authority, like there's nobody above their authority. They seem to have, they seem to be immovable. They seem to be unassailable. And some people live and die, and that doesn't even change. They just, they, they, they're born within that empire, they die in that empire, they never see the empire change or fall. But from heaven's perspective, these empires only, are, only have authority for a period and then they fall. And another one's risen up in its place and then that falls. And then another one, and then that falls. So from heaven's perspective, they're saying, it's saying to Daniel, 
yes, there is this power on the earth, but it's not forever, it's going to fall. And then there's going to be another one, and that's represented by different things. And then there's going to be another one, and then there's going to be another one. And we know that they have names. You have the Babylonian Empire, and when that fell, it was taken over by the Persians and Medes. And when that fell, there was the Greek Empire, and when the Greek Empire fell, there was the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire had various things going on within it. And it's when you get to that empire that suddenly you see the thrones appear, God appear, something changes in the Roman Empire. And, from, and Daniel sees that at that point, first of all, you see God on his throne, and then you see a person. In verse 13, the clouds, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So bear with me. <laughs> what Daniel is being shown is, the first thing he's being told is, Babylon might seem all-powerful at the moment, but it does not have the final word, and it is going to fall. In fact, there's going to be several empires that are going to come and go, because the authorities on earth come and they go. But when we get to the Roman Empire, a kingdom is going to begin in a new way on the earth that's never going to end. And that's the kingdom that Jesus is talking to when he spoke to Pilate. Jesus, there's this wonderful conversation between Jesus and Pilate. And it's a conversation about authority, about power. And Pilate is saying, don't you understand that I have the authority to kill you, you know, over your life? Don't you, don't you get that I'm in charge? <laughs> saying. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you're not really, are you? Which is kind of annoying, Pilate, I think. Because Jesus is saying, no, there's a different kingdom. The kingdom that I have is an, an eternal kingdom. That's the kingdom that, my, if you like, I'm filling in some blanks, but my father is giving me the kingdom on the earth. And it's an eternal kingdom. And so you don't have authority over me. And, and it's like a battle of authorities going on. But you see, what's giving Jesus his security in that situation, even though he knows he's going to his death? And, it's wonderful when you read the passages about him going to the cross. When you really look at them, he's the only one who knows what's going on. <laughs> Everybody else is sort of in a panic and disarray around him and trying to have authority in the situation. But he knows exactly what is taking place. And he knows that time is the time to submit to his Father's will. And he walks in it because his security is in the eternal kingdom that belongs to the Father. His security is in, he's looking at things with heaven's perspective and with a throne eye view, if that makes sense. And that gives him security. We see these images again when John gets shown again. He gets a similar view. Again, he gets taken up into heaven and he sees heaven's point of view about what's going on on the earth at that time. And at that time, it is that kingdom. It is the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire appears to have unassailable power and authority and is extremely cruel. And yet, even in that situation, John is lifted up to heaven and he sees the same things, more detail. But the ultimate message of Revelation is 
It doesn't matter what things look like on the earth. It doesn't matter who says they have authority or don't have authority. It doesn't matter what they say. At the end of the day, there is one person who has authority, and that's Jesus. He is the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. And his word is higher than any other word and any other authority, and his kingdom is eternal. And that's where our security lies. If you like, I suppose, um, when Daniel has the vision, if it's any consolation, it says that he was really anxious. <laughs> I mean, it really impacted him physically. In fact, all the people who had visions like this, who were shown things like this, and I always feel like it's like a curtain of our physical world is drawn back, and they just see beyond. They see a different perspective. And it has a huge impact on them physically and emotionally. And I, I think sometimes when we read the book of Revelation, if we manage to get that far in reading it, because it's quite heavy going, we can also get very anxious and worried when we read these things. But the underlying thrust of these messages is there's something beyond what we see. There's someone higher than, than people who would say they have authority in this time. And we can put our security in his authority. And so I suppose in terms, in practical terms, in relation to our finances, whatever we decide um, regarding what we've been talking about today, about stewardship, we don't have to make those decisions out of anxiety. We can make those decisions out of security that we belong to our Father, that Jesus is our Lord, and he, his kingdom is eternal and utterly secure. And we make our decisions regarding what we do according to the knowledge that Jesus is Lord of all. Does that make sense? Now that can take some time because we do, like Daniel, Daniel felt anxious. He wasn't immediately, yes, I'm in faith and it's all wonderful. It, it was overwhelming for him. There's sometimes a battle with our emotions to accept, if you say, and, and lean on, put all our weight on the fact that Jesus is Lord of all. Um, and um, I'm just going to speak that today. <laughs> the name of Jesus is above every name, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And any authority on the earth, whatever kind of authority it might be, will pass away. But the authority of Jesus will never pass away. And he is our Lord. And that's the kingdom that we belong to. Let's pray. acknowledge that Jesus is Lord over all. And in our lives, as we live our lives, we go through all sorts of different emotions and experiences. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you are Lord. But we know yet that it is true and that we can trust in you, that we can trust your authority, that at the end of the day, whenever that might be, you have the final word, and your word is just, and your word is kind. So acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We declare that he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings the eternal ruler and we bow our knee to him in the name of Jesus we pray Amen Thank you We believe in one God
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come before you in prayer this morning on this Stewardship Sunday, we give thanks, Lord, that you care for each one of us. You care for our earth, and you have filled it with your riches. We thank you for our freedom and the opportunity to contribute our skills and values towards the good of society. Help us to always remember those who are less fortunate than us. And we lift up in prayer the victims of poverty and racism and all those who suffer from forms of political and economic oppression. Let our words speak of your peace and let us proclaim our hope in Christ as Saviour of all mankind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And today, from the Barnabas Prayer Diary, we pray for Afghanistan. Sovereign Lord, we lift up our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghanistan remaining in the country after the Taliban takeover. We ask for your divine guidance for them to live under a government which believes it is right to impose a death sentence on any Muslim background convert. Please grant them protection and wisdom to know how to live as children of light under such oppression. We pray that if any are called to give their lives for Christ, they will be filled with the peace, the joy, and the presence of their Lord and our Lord, in whose name we pray. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. our prayer. We pray for Robert and for Rachel as they minister in our community. And we give thanks for all the ministries that take place on a weekly basis. We pray for Gary and his work with our young people, for the Edward Bear Club and for Coffee Stop. We give thanks for the outreach ministries of Can't Sing, Won't Sing, the opportunities to work with Poor Inland Primary School. We ask for you to be with the head teacher, the staff and the children, especially as we all try to move forward and COVID rates remain high. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we pray for all people known to us who need to feel healing in their lives. And I will leave a moment's silence as we remember those dear to us as we bring them before the Lord. Heavenly Father, please send your healing to these people. And I pray for your healing power to be in all our lives. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are all part of your family. May we each play our part to encourage our sisters and brothers 
so that we can all live our lives to your praise and glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us now please offer to one another a sign of God's peace. Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people, that they plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works may by you be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I have heard my people cry.
Now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep all your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. And so let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.